go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, here's a good question for you. Was Donald Trump right? I mean, in the debate, he was fact-checked, I don't know, like a bunch of times. It didn't seem Kamala Harris was being fact-checked all that much. But there was one in particular today. Have a listen. There is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. Madam Vice President. When is that true? Uh, Lindsay Davis from ABC made this statement. It caught a lot of people's attention. But it turns out that, in fact, she might have been wrong about that because there are at least three states. New York, the home base of uh, Station Cross Catholic Media Network, uh, Illinois, Minnesota. Minnesota is very interesting because that's where. Governor Tim Walz is, and he helped to remove the reporting requirements and restrictions on babies born alive and abortion under his leadership in that state. In fact, there are records of babies who have been left to die after being born alive there. We're going to cover that story at 14 past the hour with Brent Haynes. We're going to be diving into that. Also on the team, you know, Bishop Strickland just came back from our big conference, August the 24th in Niagara Falls. It was an amazing event. He gave a great talk. Let's take seriously that this is the gathering where the Lord of the universe comes to us. It was a great talk. It was very inspiring, I would say. But I saw an article over on LifeSite News that says he was offering an apology uh, over on X. In fact, Eric Sammons uh, called for bishops of the Catholic Church to sincerely apologize for closing their parishes, for shutting down their masses. So Bishop Joseph Strickland responded by offering an apology. I remember the day that Bishop Joseph Strickland closed his parishes because I was coming out of mass and I checked my phone, saw the notification, and I thought, oh, no, because the very next day I was scheduled to have him on my radio program and have a conversation. And I thought it would be impossible for me not to ask him about why he did that. And so I remember that day very, very fondly. So we're going to have a conversation with Bishop Joseph Strickland at 30 past the hour, not only about his time in Buffalo and not only about why he is now apologizing for that, but also about a big, big uh, pilgrimage that he's got coming up to Greece and to Turkey in May. So all of that and more on the program today. It's going to be a jam-packed show. Would encourage you to uh, pray along with us and share us with a friend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Most Blessed Virgin, with the Most Holy Name of Mary, pray for us. The Feast of the Holy Name of Mary originated in the early 16th century and was first celebrated on September 15th, the octave day of Our Lady's Nativity on September 8th. This would have been the anniversary of the day that Our Lady's parents, Saints Joachim and Anne, gave their daughter the name of Mary, eight days after her birth, according to the law. The feast was later moved to September 17th, and was still only celebrated locally. On September 12th, in the year of our Lord, 1683, King Jan Sobieski and his famed Polish cavalry of winged hussars, along with other imperial forces, placed themselves under the protection of the Blessed Virgin, thundered down the hills near Vienna in the largest cavalry charge in history, and totally routed the Muslim Turks besieging the city. The Polish king proclaimed, We came, we saw, God conquered. In thanksgiving for the rescue of Christendom from the Muslim invasion, Pope Blessed Innocent XI extended the feast of the Holy Name of Mary to the entire church, originally on the Sunday after Our Lady's Nativity, 
and later fixed to the anniversary of the victory itself. This feast was removed from the calendar in 1969, but later restored by Pope St. John Paul II. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. Most Blessed Virgin Mary, pray for us. And now, your headline news. Just the News reports Ohio governor sending $2.5 million in law enforcement to Springfield, Ohio. Mike DeWine, the GOP governor of Ohio, is sending law enforcement and $2.5 million in health funding to assist the city of Springfield with the influx of temporary Haitian migrants. 15,000 Haitians have arrived in the city of roughly 59,000 people since 2020. Dwine called on the federal government to do more to support Clark County Health Department in handling the influx. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost is looking into how to stop the Biden-Harris administration from sending large groups of migrants to local communities in the state. And no matter what uh, the uh, city manager there or the NBC, ABC uh, moderators, whoever they were, uh, there is lots of pets being slaughtered for the table in there. As well. Hey, Daily Wire is reporting Australia considers banning children under 16 from social media. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of Australia announced on Monday that his government will introduce legislation that would enforce a minimum age for social media and other digital platforms. He followed up on Tuesday by informing the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that he is considering making the platform unavailable to children under the age of 14 to 16. Back in March, Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law legislation that banned children under the age of 14 from holding accounts on social media platforms such as TikTok and Instagram and others. And Catholic Vote is reporting abortion giant caught circumventing pro-life laws. Pro-life leaders are warning that Planned Parenthood is attempting to evade pro-life laws in Missouri and Oklahoma by opening a new abortion mill in the Kansas border city of Pittsburgh. Planned Parenthood Great Plains attempted to hide its purchase of the building through a string of property investment limited liability companies. But they have been caught sneaky, aren't they? And those those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. Jesus said to his disciples, To you who hear, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other one as well. And from the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend money to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. But rather love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as also your Father is merciful. Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down and overflowing. Be poured into your lap. For the measure with which you measure will in turn be measured out to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father Hadock would say, Jesus Christ does not order us to never to refuse a petition, but the meaning of his words is that we are to give what is just and reasonable 
What will be neither injurious to yourself nor your family for what is unjustly asked may be justly denied. There are lots of, I would say, myths and misconceptions that are happen in this passage that people sometimes take, like, for instance, saying, well, we can never, ever judge for anything ever. Simply not true. You must judge. In fact, there are the passages in which you have to judge a person by the fruits and the merits of their actions, uh, by the fruit of the tree. They will be judged. In fact, when we go to heaven or when we die and we stand before the judgment seat of God is based on what we've done with our life. So similarly, that's the ultimate judgment, but the judgment here on this planet, in this world, rests upon bishops and priests. The ordinary of the home, for instance, must judge the actions of those under them. So judgments must still happen in society. A judge must judge the people in front of their, their in the courtroom, for instance, a police officer, a doctor. There's all kinds of examples where judgments have to happen. So to say that you should never judge again is simply not true. It's fake news. And uh, we're fact-checking that today. St. Christian would say, When thou hast seen God made man and suffering so many things for thee, dost thou still ask and doubt how is it possible to pardon the iniquities of thy fellow servants who has suffered? Who has suffered what God has suffered? When he has bound, scourged, endured, enduring the spat upon suffering death? Yeah, we have not yet walked a mile in the Lord's shoes. So let us be cautious in our judgments of others. Let us be cautious in our condemnation of others. That is prudent advice, to be sure. Hey, coming up after the break, let's fact check the fact checkers. What do you say? I think there's some big news there. We're going to talk about it. It's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at uh, 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Uh, I'm excited to have him on the team since I haven't seen him since uh, the conference in Niagara Falls, which was amazing. But he apologized recently for having closed his parishes back in the lockdowns. We're going to talk to him about that as well. In addition to that, He's going on pilgrimage, and uh, you have an opportunity to go to pilgrimage with him. I'm going. I can't wait. We'll talk about that at 30 past the hour as well. But there is some fact-checking that needs to happen. Of course, the, the ABC poll, the ABC debate that happened the other day, it seemed as though uh, the moderators were a wee bit one-sided when it came to fact-checking. They like to fact-check Donald Trump. But one of the things they said for sure, there might have been a lot others, but one of the things they said for sure from Lindsey Davis was, um, I guess, patently false. Let's have a listen. There is no state in this country where it is legal to kill a baby after it's born. Madam Vice President, I want to get your response to it. Is that true? Is it true that there is no state that uh, allows babies to babies who are born alive to die thereafter? We're going to have that conversation right now with Brent Hainsey joining us. Good morning to you, Brent. Thanks for your time. Hello, Joe. Hello, everybody. Well, Brent, what do you say? Uh, is uh, the ABC moderator, Lindsay Davis, correct as she fact-checked and didn't give him a chance to even follow up? She just turned it over to Kamala Harris and kept rolling. What did you say? Joe, unfortunately, this is a good example of how Trump has an opportunity to make an excellent point, but he is you know, an unfocused and imprecise speaker he doesn't master command of persuasive details. And this was a situation where the moderator and then, of course, Kamala Harris's opponent jumped on his imprecision and his overheated rhetoric, which he always uses, to deflect the truth and to twist the facts. So Trump was trying to make the point that Walls and Harris are radical abortion extremists who support abortion up to the moment of birth. And he tried to prove this by also saying, look, they, they even support allowing babies to die after abortions, which sounds radical enough on its own. And it's hard to get people to believe that because it just sounds so incredible, like literally incredible, not credible, not believable. Uh, but the fact is, that's what happens. Um, Trump referred 
to a statement, a famous statement by Governor Ralph Northam, who is a, who is a Democrat, who was the governor of Virginia in 2019, who was doing a radio interview supporting a late-term abortion bill in Virginia. And he made this statement. He, when asked about uh, this situation and about the bill on late-term abortions, the Democrat, Governor Northam, said only five years ago, quote, the infant would be delivered, the infant would be kept comfortable, the infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and family desire. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. So Trump re- tried to refer to this statement. I mean, first of all, he wrongly confused Virginia with West, West Virginia with Virginia, which is unfortunate for the governor and good people of West Virginia because they're very <laughs> pro-life. But he did correct that when he came back and re- referred to Virginia. And Trump used the overheated rhetoric of saying that they are executions. He says vice pres- the vice presidential pick says abortion in the ninth month is absolutely fine. That is an absolutely true statement, Joe. He went on to say, quote, he also says he also says execution after birth. It's execution, no longer abortion, because the baby is born alive and is OK. And that's not OK with me. Yeah. Again, Trump always goes in for this overheated language. And when you sometimes when you use overheated language, when your rhetoric is over the top, people focus on your rhetoric and not on the facts. Now, you and I and other pro-lifers familiar with the issue, we could reasonably say, look, when you starve a baby to death after abortion, that's a type of execution. What happened to St. Maximilian Colby and his colleagues in the concentration camp? They starved them to death, right? They put them in a bunker, starved them to death as a form of execution. And then, of course, they had to finish off Maximilian Colby with poison. It's perfectly reasonable to say that that's an execution. You use that kind of language, you start to lose people. Polls show that most Americans won't even believe you if you tell them that Democrats support abortion up until the moment of birth. I mean, there's polling that supports that. You know, people just are are, are often aren't well-informed on the issue. Here's what Trump should have said. Trump should have said, Vice President Harris and her running mate, Tim Walz, are both on record supporting abortion on demand up until the moment of birth. In fact, since Tim Walz became governor of Minnesota, at least eight babies survived abortions only to die because doctors did not provide food, hydration, or other life-saving medical care. These statistics were reported by Governor Walz's own state agency. And then what did Governor Walz do? Was he horrified the babies who survived abortion did not receive medical care as required by state law? Did he investigate why the Minnesota Born Alive Act had not been enforced? No. Instead, Tim Walls worked with the Minnesota legislature to pass a law eliminating the requirement that Minnesota state government stop reporting Born Alive statistics. He amended the law to make sure that they stopped reporting these embarrassing statistics. And for good measure, Walls' new law also eliminated eliminated the requirement that medical professionals provide life-saving medical care for infants who survive abortion. That's what Trump should have said. There's no overheated rhetoric in that. There's just pure, unadulterated facts. Now, you could argue that the babies didn't die only because uh, uh, they didn't receive medical care. The medical records from the Minnesota state government show that, you know, some of them were pre-viable or believed to be pre-viable. And they could say, well, they would have died anyway. Two of them did receive comfort care, but that's not life-saving care. But that's the way Trump should have made the point. And how does Kamala Harris come back? Come on, how does Kamala Harris come back and respond to that? How does Tim Walz come back and respond to that? You know, how, what does the moderator say to that? They're probably not. They're probably not even going to want to address that issue. They'll let Kamala handle that one. Uh, so the first problem was Trump didn't present the information in a manner that people would find persuasive. And so, as you pointed out, the moderator jumped in, and Kamala Harris then piled on with her comment by saying, I told you at the beginning, you know, that he was going, he was going, to, lie, he was going to lie, that you're going to hear a lot of lies tonight. But look, the basic facts are, yes, there are babies who survive abortion. This is a mm-hmm. real phenomenon. It has been documented in peer-reviewed articles in medical journals. People can go and look at information 
at the uh, abortionsurvivors.org website. They can review the testimony or hear the speakers when they travel around the country of people who have actually survived abortion and have the medical records to prove it and talk about this phenomenon. The CDC estimates that between 2003 and 2014, at least 143 babies died after being born alive during wow. abortions. Now, the CDC says it's even possible that this undercounts the actual number, which, knowing how the medical business is, knowing how statistics are kept and how embarrassing this is, that's very likely. You know, it, as one person said, it, you know, sort of like uh, it's sort of like turning your, yourself into the IRS for, for underpaying your taxes or, or asking for an audit. Why would you ask for an audit if they're going to find something that's only going to hurt you? Mm. Uh, and the CDC only counted the babies who died. I mean, there are those people out there who actually live. There are a few who actually live and then go on and have healthy lives, and healthy enough to go, how healthy and happy enough to go around speaking on this issue. It's just that, strangely enough, the mainstream media never interviews those people, never talks to them, never presents their stories to the public. Uh, people who doubt this issue really should visit abortionsurvivors.org. The Charlotte Lozier Institute has a good summary of this issue. Uh, they have compelling information. People who say, well, that's just a pro-life advocacy group, well, they don't have to believe the Charlotte Lozier Institute. They can look at the sources for the original information that, Sarge, Sar, that the Charlotte Lozier Institute puts on their website. They can go to the original sources and check, such as the peer-reviewed medical journals. So, Joe, this is, this is a genuine issue. And Governor Northam, he's not the only person to say that or do that. And Tim Walz isn't the only person to say that or to take that kind of action when he was governor of Minnesota. Barack Obama, when Oof. he was in the Illinois State Senate, he opposed the Illinois version of the Infants Born Alive Protection Act. And that was a, simply a, a state version of a federal bill. Barack Obama misrepresented his votes on that bill. He tried to claim that that bill wasn't the same as the federal bill. It would have undermined support for abortion. So what happened was supporters of the bill put in language that was essentially the same as the language in the federal bill. And Barack Obama still voted to he voted for that language and he still voted to kill that bill in the Illinois State Senate. He was the chairman of the committee that killed it in one session. That bill at the federal level was one that even NARAL did not oppose. Wow. Even NARAL didn't oppose it. Even NARAL no recognized, kidding. hey, might be a bit extreme if we if we oppose a bill saying we ought, we ought to you know, protect infants who are born alive. But not it wasn't too extreme for Barack Obama. It wasn't too extreme for Tim Walls. It's not too extreme for Kamala Harris. This is the position of the Democrat nominees for president and vice president of the United States, and they ought to be held accountable politically. Hmm. You know, uh, the Charlotte Lozier, which, by the way, we're going to be linking to all of these uh, in the show notes today at the station, the cross dot com forward slash ACT. But at the Charlotte Lozier website, it says only 18 states have laws offering robust protections to babies who survive abortions, although others have recently taken steps to strengthen their laws. However, many of the states with the most extreme abortion laws do not afford such protections to born alive babies. Alaska, Colorado, New Jersey, New Mexico, Oregon, Vermont, and the District of Columbia all permit abortion at any time for any reason, yet none of these states have established legal protections for born alive infants. Let that sink in. Some states like New York and Illinois have even enacted laws that eliminated previous protections for babies born alive. Uh, this is insane. In fact, uh, there is a, a map. We're going to link to it. It says born alive protections by state, Minnesota, Illinois, New York, the most extreme of all of the 50 states in the United States. It's just it's absolutely it's unacceptable. It's murder. And we shouldn't just uh, stand by and just say it's OK. It's not OK in New York and it's somehow, you know, fine in Texas. No, I'm sorry. It's wrong everywhere on planet Earth because it's murder. It's called natural law. It applies to all human beings, not just the Catholic ones. But nonetheless, this is what we're dealing with in, the, in this uh, modern times of ours. It just seems utterly bizarre. The other thing I'm going to link to is the actual statement from Virginia Governor Ralph Northam. And what he said about babies who are born alive. And then a discussion happens, Brent. And then they just decide to uh, let the baby die afterwards. It's sick. It's disgusting. And it's hard to believe rational people actually say these things, isn't it? 
Well, a good way to think about this, especially for anybody who wants to take back, uh, step back, calm, calm down the overheated rhetoric, and, and just think about what's happening is, imagine all the scenarios which happen where a woman who intends to give birth and is trying to give birth has an emergency early delivery, especially starting around the 21 to 22 week mark where babies can still survive. Think of all the efforts the hospitals go to to make those babies, help those babies survive. Think of the neonatal intensive care units that those little preemies are put in. We even have the word preemie for this person. Yet if that similar baby is born at the same gestational age, because the woman had a failed abortion, they make no effort to save those babies in those days. Amen. Brent Haynes. All depends on the intention of the mother. Well said. Thank you, sir, for your time and your input on this. We'll be linking to all of that in the show notes today. Brent, we'll see you next week. We'll be right back. More breaking news and stories. And Bishop Joseph Strickland is on the team. He's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Hey, do us a favor, though. Share us with a friend. More of a Catholic Take is coming up next. Hi, Joe McClain here, host of A Catholic Take. And I am so grateful that you are on our team. This program, A Catholic Take, and all of our programs that we produce at the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network would not be possible if it wasn't for your financial contribution and your prayers. Right now, we are in the middle of our 2024 Fall Appeal. The theme is celebrating 25 years. Can you believe it? It's been 25 years since Mother Angelica motivated Jim and Joanne Wright to put their heart in the same place that their passion was. And they formed and founded this apostolate. And here we are, 25 years later. But we need your financial contribution to keep going. We're going to be on the air September the 30th through October 4th. And we want your generous support. Whatever God puts on your heart, it's going to mean the world to us. And you can return that through the envelope that we mailed to you on our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling in when we're live on air. God love you. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Breitbart reports Texas Border City Hotel shut down after alleged gang activity. A Texas judge shut down a hotel in the border city of El Paso following reports from city officials regarding criminal activity involving a Venezuelan gang. City officials complained in a lawsuit against the owners of the Gateway Hotel after responding to nearly 700 calls for service to the address. The El Paso County Attorney's Office filed a lawsuit against the owners, alleging the owners had been operating the hotel without a valid certificate of occupancy for approximately six years. Noticing any trends here across the country with Venezuelan gangs? Just saying. A ground news is reporting EU court rules Google and Apple must pay billions in antitrust and tax cases. The European Court of Justice ruled that Apple must pay a 13 billion euro tax bill to Ireland, ending a decade long legal battle occurring just after the company announced product upgrades. The court also upheld a 2.4 billion euro antitrust fine against Google for favoring its own services over competitors in Europe. The ruling confirms that European Commission's decision against both companies regarding unfair practices and tax obligations. And Catholic Vote is reporting. Harris won the debate, but Trump is winning on top issues. In a poll conducted by SSRS for CNN on Tuesday, a strong majority of respondents indicated that Democratic nominee Kamala Harris performed better then Republican nominee Donald Trump in the night's debate hosted by ABC. The same polls respondents, however, overwhelmingly indicated that Trump would, quote, better handle the economy and immigration among the top issues of the 2024 election cycle. Those those are your headline news. Praise be to God. He just recently, by the grace of God, had a wonderful opportunity to uh, to be able to uh, visit and hang out with Bishop Joseph Strickland, Bishop Emeritus of Tyler, Texas, at his talk in our Niagara Falls conference back on August the 24th. Fantastic talk, which, by the way, we sent all of the talks to our email list yesterday. So if you're on the email list, then you got the talks in your inbox. You can join our email list. Just go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT and get signed up to the insiders list there today. We'll make sure you get those talks in your inbox later this week. We'll be rolling them out publicly to everybody else 
over the next, I don't know, six weeks or so. But Bishop Joseph Strickland joins us again this morning. Good morning to you, Your Excellency. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Joe. Thank you. I want to start with a story that hit the uh, hit uh, sort of the social media this week, if that's OK. And that was you responding to Eric Sammons. Eric Sammons put out a tweet uh, on X or whatever we're calling it these days, says, quote, I wish I wish our bishops knew the spiritual blessings that would be unleashed on the church by a simple and sincere public apology for shutting down public masses during covid, to which you responded by saying, Eric, I offer my apology as you have requested. I was duped by the media hype and should have been stronger. Let's pray for all shepherds to have stronger supernatural faith as we face more challenges in the future. May Christ be our light in whatever darkness we face. I think a lot of people thought that was incredibly inspirational. I know I did. But I remember the night that you shut your parishes for uh, the lockdown. Because the next morning, you and I talked on the radio, and I was like, oh, no, how am I going to talk to Bishop Strickland about this? Can you take us back to that? What was that What was that moment like for you? Why did you feel like you had to come to that conclusion? How hard was that? If you could share some insight. Well, really, Joe, um, looking back, I, I think, as I said in that um, er, reply to Eric, um, Everything we were hearing, it was a strange time, and it continued, in some ways continues until now, uh, just not knowing what was true, what wasn't. Um, and honestly, the the push from the, the media and, you know, in, in conversation with other bishops, it was just, that's what we were doing. And it was almost like there was no questioning it. And honestly, I really didn't question it. I, I hope and pray that I would be in a different place um, if something similar were to develop in the future. Hopefully we learn from our mistakes. But um, I really, honestly, simply followed the, the party line, you could say. I followed mm-hmm. what was being established as, because we had had discussions as, the bishops of Texas, it it hadn't gone further than that, but, you know, that's 15 dioceses here in Texas. And we had discussions and there was really no um, serious questioning of what, you know, everybody was saying, oh, we have to shut down. This is what we've got to do. This is good for the people. And it, it was in the, you know, I guess sort of in the fog of war, you could say, the fog of the battle. Um, I just didn't honestly take a step back and say, wait a minute, Um, what is our faith? What is going on? What, you know, what what are we doing? Um, And honestly, Joe, uh, and that's why I was willing to, to say, to respond and say, I do apologize. I was a bishop and I didn't say, we're going to continue with having masses. I mean, who knows how many people would have shown up but because we're all getting the same media hype and officials in the church and in the government were telling us, oh, this must happen. This is unprecedented. I mean, you probably remember that word was used I do. like milk. I mean, it was like everything was unprecedented. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember I, Eric I, Salmon's. I re- I remember Eric Salmon, he had this map and he was blacking out every state or every diocese that was shutting their doors and it was getting blacker and blacker and blacker. And, uh, and then you, and then you of course announced yours and it was like, it was like a blackout at that point. And the ominous feeling of that, it felt really overwhelming to, I think the average lay person. And, uh, you know, they said we need 14 days to slow the spread. Okay, fine. Fair enough. We don't know what we're dealing with. I'll give you 14 days. But when you're when you're 6 months later, you're starting to question the narrative, right? I mean, that's fair. Like we're 6 months later we're like, I don't at this point what we need is supernatural it grace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I remember also you um you you began to uh you began to lead the way in many ways as far as bishops go around the country leading you were out eucharistic processions in the streets you were praying for your faithful and we saw i think there was lots of 
other examples around the world of uh, uh, bishops trying to bless their diocese, et cetera. But it may, could you tell us about how difficult was it to, to continue down that path? I mean, at some point, I, I felt like the church needed to just say, hey, we tried it your way, but now it's over. We're going right back to the sacraments. Why, why didn't they do that sooner? Is it, was it just like a, a, a year later, there, there were still dioceses closed. Why, why didn't they open sooner? Well, uh, complex reasons, I guess, to answer that. Um, each place was different. And I do acknowledge being in Texas. I was glad to be in Texas in the Amen. middle of all of that because Texas was less locked down than a lot of places. Um, so that was part of it. Uh, the, I mean, I remember sitting in my office and we were given some sort of a contact to see how many cases there were in, by county. And I was watching that religiously. Um, oh, wow. And I use that word very uh, intentionally because really what, looking back, thankfully, I, you know, I'm a sinner and I fail, obviously, but I am a man of prayer. And I believe that mm. through prayer, uh, I started to see, as you were describing, pretty much immediately the 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 discrepancy between what we were hearing and what we know to be the truth in Jesus Christ in our Catholic Amen. faith, and that's what inspired me. I, I guess it it's, became sort of even in those two weeks, and certainly after it became kind of a a whack a mole game, you know, which is a silly image, I guess, but that's what it felt like because it was like well, maybe we could do this. You say, oh, no, you can't do that. That's too many people. That's too close. All these different things. But we, one thing that I um, did decide from the beginning, our churches were not locked. The buildings were o- open for the faithful. And some people can't. Praise God. I mean, and we actually had instructions about you can't be closer than, you know, all that arbitrary stuff that we can see now in mm. hindsight. Six feet apart, what does that do? You know, I mean, <laughs> you're breathing. You're you're going beyond six feet. But anyway, uh, it was all just this um, artificially constructed idea of this is what you have to fear and this is what will protect you. It's like, you know, it, some parodies really should illustrate that, you know, oh, they're telling us <laughs> stand on one foot, you know. And yeah. I mean, it's just, it was that kind of arbitrariness, but thankfully, because, yeah. you know, I'm not a super intelligent guy, but I believe it was through prayer that I began to see that we need to resist this as much as we can. And that's when I decided to, I was in those days, I was going out because I, it occurred to me, here I am in my little chapel in Eucharistic Adoration. And so I took that outside. I went into adoration out on the front steps of the cathedral in the mm-hmm. Broadway, the busiest street in Tyler. And, and people appreciated that because Amen. I said, well, if I'm going to be praying, people need to see me praying. And I had signs up that I was praying for the, the people of Tyler, the, the people of the county, the people of Texas, and the nation, really the world. But um, so I began to do those things. We kept the churches open. We had confessions outside. Thankfully, many of the priests were right there with me saying, Bishop, let's do everything we can. Um, other other priests were saying, oh, no. And they had, you know, almost like living in hermetically sealed, you know, That's suits before they could go see someone or do anything. Um, so <clears throat> I think... Uh, thankfully, Texas, we were, without uh, welcoming people back to public mass for six weeks, which was a long time. But as you said, some places are still not as open as they should be. Um, yeah. But thankfully, we began to open up. And, and like I said, being in Texas was an advantage because the laws and the the I mean, especially East Texas. I mean, we're as Texas as you get around here. Um, Amen. And as far as the topic of guns, of of real faith in Jesus Christ, it's not a Catholic area, but it's a very 
uh, Jesus Christ as Lord area. So all of that created an atmosphere in East Texas. I mean, a lot of the good old boys are just the down to earth common sense people here very quickly said, forget these masks, forget all this stuff and began to just do everything they could to go back to, to normal life. I mean, Amen. through all of that, Joe, I've been, I was glad then, and I'm even more glad to not be, because even in Texas, in the large cities, it was different. In Houston or Dallas or San Antonio, the lockdown was more severe. But in rural yeah. East Texas, I mean, you saw fewer people, you know, outside with masks, which was ridiculous, or driving around in their cars alone with masks. You saw some of that, but, but it was much less. So that supported an atmosphere. I remember, and people will testify, I drove people crazy on Palm, <laughs> Palm Sunday weekend. I said, we've got to find a way to open. And I tried probably 20 different scenarios. And that, like I said, it was whack-a-mole. Everyone, they said, oh, no, that's too close for people. And you know, the big question was how to reverently receive our Lord in the Eucharist. And I just didn't figure out a way to do that, that the people that wow. I was talking to say that would work. We're right at a break. Bishop Joseph Strickland's with us. Thank you, Your Excellency, for being on with us. I do want to uh, ask you on the other side of the break, you, do you think that the bishops will go for another round of COVID lockdowns if that should ever come? God forbid, but if it did... Would they lock their churches down again? That's a big question on a lot of our minds. But I remember that Easter Sunday when there was no public mass, the highest feast day of the year, no mass. We had to watch it on television. I cried. I wept. That was so hard. That was so hard. More on that with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Plus, he's going on pilgrimage, and you could go with him. We'll talk about that as well coming up after the break. Be right back. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Praise be to God. Hey, can I just say thank you to our sponsor, iCatholic Mobile. If you got to have a cell phone bill, why not make sure that that cell phone bill helps to support Catholic organizations like ours, helping us to stay on the radio, across our radio network, on the live video feeds, our podcasts, and so much more. iCatholic Mobile is a fantastic partner, and they've got data plans and coverage around the country. Check them out at iCatholic Mobile. Com. We're having a conversation with Bishop Joseph Strickland, uh, and uh, by the way, he's going on pilgrimage, and you could go with him. I'm going to put a link in the description, but he's going to Greece, he's going to Turkey, and it's going to be a great time, and I'm going with him, and I can't wait. I cannot wait to be where St. Paul was, the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. John the Apostle, and listen to Bishop Joseph Strickland preach. It's just going to be like a, a bucket list item for me. And that's coming up. We're going to put a link in the description at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Your Excellency, thank you again for your time. So uh, let me just ask a lot of people are wanting to know do you think, have the bishops learned any lessons from the, the COVID lockdown? Do you think they would go through it again if, if there was another pandemic, if the, if the media hype got, you know, uh, got uh, worked up all over again and the insurance providers were telling them, you, you got to be careful? We don't want to have lawsuits. We want to get people sick. Do you think that the bishops would shut the doors once again? Well, Joe, I think that question has sort of been uh, bouncing around for a while now. <clears throat> and really, I would answer it in terms of really supernatural faith. And it's like, well, what's that about? Um, but really, uh, in my own journey, and I think for the bishops, I mean, I would say if if another similar kind of lockdown approach were to happen, um, I think more bishops would resist, but mm. some would be the would be condemning those who were resisting. I mean, I can imagine the scenario already uh, because some of that happened even with the the past pandemic, um, if that's really what it was, but. Um, it's funny because before I was removed and, it, you know, people have been asking the question for a while. And I remember saying, I mean, people were contacting me and said, Bishop, if they do lock us down again, will you do it? And I said, 
they'll have to lock me up before I will lock things Amen. down. And so, you know, maybe that was overheard. I don't know. But <laughs> I, I think it really comes down to where do you put your faith? Is it in insurance companies and media and government officials or Jesus Christ? I mean, that's mm. a pretty stark question, but I think that's the question that it comes down to. And, you know, and I'm not accusing anyone of not being a, a man of faith, bishops or otherwise, but if if you really believe, I mean, look to the martyrs, look to the saints, even in the specific circumstances of previous pandemics that were real, uh, where people were literally dying in droves in major cities in the world, um, and there was no lockdown of anything. I mean, of course, they'd say, oh, well, they didn't have the science. Well, uh, they did. They had more faith also. Um, yeah. So I think it would really be a question of that. And I do believe there would be more bishops that would say, we're not doing it. But I think there would be some that would be really in lockstep with the officials saying, oh, we must do this. And there would be a lot, there were a lot of divisions over all of that stuff. As we remember, I, I remember people in, in terms of communion, people say, oh, you can't possibly offer people communion. And other bishops were saying, I'm going to allow this. And it would be more of that. But I hope there would be many more that would be uh, keeping things open and trusting in the Lord. Certainly, you know, I mean, we, we need to be reasonable about our physical health. But I guess I would frame what we did before. We were unreasonable about both. We were doing things or saying, you know, it, without, of course, I'm not a scientist. I don't know, but we do have common sense. And I think common sense failed or we failed to really use our common sense and yeah. also to, to operate from faith. And hopefully that would be much stronger in, in the future. <laughs> Uh, I remember St. Charles Borromeo during the uh, Black Plague that he was suffering from. He, he, he didn't say he brought mass outside, right, uh, because of that. But he never, never failed to continue to distribute Holy Communion to those, even those that were dying of the plague. He still made sure that his priests, they, had, they made these little sticks, at, in fact, if I, if I remember correctly, to distribute Holy Communion to those that were infected. So even the infection couldn't stop him. And it reminded me that where there's a will, there's a way. And this was maybe it's because I served in the Marine Corps that I got beaten into my head so bad, but where there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, you know, that Easter Sunday of 2020, when there was zero public mass uh, on the highest feast day of the year, I just kept thinking, well, there's a will, there's a way. Are you telling me there's no possibility? Like, I, I just disagree. It, it's it, you, can, you can give us a televised mass, uh, you, then why not just bring us to allow us to come to mass, but then don't distribute Holy Communion to the faithful? Like, you could have made that dispensation, but no, I'm not talking about you specifically, but just the church in general. And I just remember feeling so heartbroken and and as a lay, lay person that the that, that my bishop, where I live, I don't live in your diocese, but where I live, I felt like my bishop abandoned me and my family uh, at the highest feast well, day. We, was... we felt betrayed in, in many ways. I was feeling that myself, Joe. And as you say, well, where there's a will, there's a way. I was trying to use my will to find every way I Amen. could. Amen. On Thanks that for Easter it. Sunday, I felt terrible. Uh, and so I did, you know, it was very limited, but symbolically and for those who were able to benefit, I know it had a huge impact because to, to demonstrate that, no, I haven't abandoned you. We're just trying to handle this the best we can with, what information we have. Mm -hmm. But I went out with one of our deacons into neighborhoods and went and stopped at people's homes, blessing them and wow. praying with the blessed mm -hmm. sacrament. I actually Praise sort of God. did a Eucharistic procession around, and it was just around Tyler, not throughout the diocese, but it, the, it, it was the best I could come up with to show people that we, we trust in yeah. our Lord and Turn to him in these times. And uh, so well that's said. whatever we're facing, that's what we need to do is turn to the Lord and find the ways that we can 
bring him to the people, whatever uh, restrictions may be placed yeah. on us. Hey, before we run out of time, let, can I switch subjects? And you're going on a pilgrimage in next May. Now, the thought occurred to me, like, since your retirement, you're more busy now than you were as, as Bishop and Tyler. Like, you're all over the world these days. How are you keeping up with that? That must that must be exhausting. Well, interestingly, Joe, I just uh, put a letter out that I've been posting letters fairly re- frequently. And my most recent letter talks about a sacred pause. And I, I recognize that in this time, I mean, and, and things are, I mean, y'all were talking about the election and everything and the abortion debate. Things are getting more heated instead of less. And yeah. so I've felt through prayer called to pray more. Um, I mean, some people have been concerned that I was, you know, shutting down totally. And I actually was contacted by somebody in this letter. I specifically say, because of the world we live in, I said, no one is telling me to do this. I'm not being instructed to be quiet, but and I'm not going to be quiet, but I do want to slow down and be at home and in prayer more because I was recognizing that I was bouncing all over the place. So um, I think we all need to ask ourselves, are we praying enough? And the the answer can never be said, oh yeah, I'm praying enough, but we need to pray more. Amen. Well, I hope you get some some good rest and and I hope your prayers uh, were were able to uh, pray for all of us as well as the world. But I am looking forward to hearing you pray in Greece and in Turkey, because that is going to be an amazing thing. If you want to go on pilgrimage with Bishop Strickland, I'll put a link in the description uh, or in our show notes over at the station of the cross dot com forward slash a C T. Your Excellency, God love you. God bless you. Thank you again for your time. And we'll see you guys right back here tomorrow morning. Catholic Radio has just been a lifesaver for me. I still listen to it every day. I start my day with it. I listen to it all day long as much as I can. I am very grateful for it. It's just an amazing thing to have as I am new to Catholicism. Obviously, it's not only helping me, but it's helping so many other people on their walk. Thank you. God bless you for iCatholic Radio. It has changed my life. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. And I believe His Excellency Bishop Strickland is still on with us. Thank you, Bishop, for for hanging out with us. I also wanted to ask you about the talk that you gave in in um, in Buffalo, which where I thought was amazing. Um, but I got to say, it was when you and I and I actually went. I think I went out to and sat in the the audience when you said this because it struck me and. Um, you, you you mentioned that you were at a hospital when you were – I guess this was years ago – and you were bringing communion to the sick and this woman asked you, did you bring him? Like when you said that, like, oh, like right there. It was so – it was so effective. It was so very powerful. And I think it's definitely something for us to remember just like we've, we've sort of uh, sanitized our faith and our approach to the faith in many ways. <clears throat> and, um, you know – I can, I think it kind of reminded me of like even when I was converting to the Catholic faith and getting into Catholic apologetics and how many times Protestants might say, but you don't have a personal relation. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? And I always felt like, ah, oh, that's so Protestant. I just don't like that language. I just feel awkward around that language now. And, and yet at the same time, it's also true. Like you, you definitely have to have a, a real sincere personal relationship with the Savior. But you can't throw the bait. Like, do you, do you see what I'm going with that? Like, I was thinking about all those things when you were saying that. Absolutely. It just really Absolutely. affected me. Yeah, Joe. That and that's the reason I share that story, and I remember it from. It, it's probably at least. Well, I've been a bishop twelve years, so probably twenty five years ago was when that wow. happened. But it it had it just really had an impact on me, and and as my faith has continued to deepen over these years. I just keep referring back to that because the wisdom of that woman uh, in the hospital bed, just just naturally saying that, did you bring him? 
I think, like you said, Joe, that we really need to retune that and really reflect and pray and deepen our understanding that the Lord we read about in the gospel is there with us, not a thought, not a memory, not, oh, his glorious words. It's all wonderful, but he's really there. He's in the room. He's in the house. (laughs) And I think we need to really reinforce that faith and live in that way. And really, Joe, it's not something I can totally express or put my finger on in a precise way, but I believe if we were to go back to the time of, like you mentioned, St. Robert Bellarmine, a great Jesuit saint of the, the past, uh, I believe we're living in a time, it's like there is a fog. There's something that I think if we were able to go back and talk to some of these saints, they'd say, well, what do you mean? What <laughs> The world we live in is so unspiritualized. It's so... Uh, saturated with a a mindset that, oh, we believe in science, and we believe in what our senses tell us, and we believe all this. And I, I think it would be very foreign to the saints of old, um, and probably not going back that far in history, but certainly in our time, it's almost an anti-faith world that we live in. And you yeah. have to kind of drill through it. You have to break through those barriers. You have to break through the the lockdown of the mind that says, oh, no, that's not possible. I mean, the Eucharistic miracles are something that, you know, I'm just continuing to learn about. But the number of Eucharistic miracles through the centuries in the church, I didn't know about. And we don't really focus on those things because I think there's something um, we're we're almost shy about saying this is real, as real as you're in your office talking to me. I'm in my home. We're yeah. This is you know we talk about virtual and we're communicating virtually, but re- we're real people, flesh and blood, talking to each other from a distance. And I think that we're just we live in a time where. It reality, it's it's not something that we're just we're not down to earth. We're we're sort of in this haze in, in all kinds of areas of really in every area of not operating the way people used to. And there there are a lot of factors in that. But like mm-hmm. I said, with all the question of, of the bishops and how they operate, I think it's a question of do we really believe this? And I've yeah. actually asked the question to the bishops, and I think too many really don't. And even, I mean, sadly, within the church, I mean, their religious leaders among the bishops and uh, among some of the religious orders, I mean, the manifesto of the Jesuits in this time is not one of faith. It's right. one of uh, globalism and fixing the world. And that isn't Jesus Christ. And Amen. as I continue to read and to learn what really, what I would call sinister agenda has infected many in the church. I mean, the church, I will die for because Christ established it. But there are many in the church now in positions of authority that don't seem to have any supernatural faith. And if they do, they need to wake up to it and respond to the world differently than what they're pushing at this point. So um, I think that, and, you know, I've just established a, a nonprofit called Pillars of Faith based mm. on two pillars and St. John, another great saint, St. John Bosco's visions. He had a lot of visions, but the principal vision for me is the church as a ship in a terrible storm anchored to a pillar of of the Eucharist and a pillar of Mary. And I think that in our time, I mean, look at all the Marian apparitions and the the Vatican is trying to pull away from them, it seems, in very significant ways with a document that says, oh, we're not going to really certify anything as truly supernatural. We'll tell you if it's 
contrary to the faith, but we're not going to go out on a limb and say, this is supernatural. Um, that's contrary to what the church has done before. So those two pillars in, I mean, the Eucharist and Mary, especially in her Marian apparitions of the past 500 years at least, um, they tell us, look with eyes of faith at your world, believe in the supernatural truth that is the truth that God has revealed through his son. I think we're in an age that is antagonistic toward a lot of that, but as Catholics, and I think that's why people are antagonistic toward the Catholic Church, because we yeah. stand for a way of living and a vision of life that says all of this globalism and one global community is not Jesus Christ. And to pretend that science will save us is blasphemy when we know Jesus Christ is our only Lord and Savior. And, you know, there's so many things that are being said and the way people are operating, even within the church, it's like the church is not really who she is. It's just sort of a, a, a an organization of human beings to help us feed each other. Um, if we leave the Lord out of that effort, yes, we need to feed the poor. We need to help those who have don't even have their essentials in life. But that has to be motivated by faith. And if yeah. that the only motivation is feed the people and you leave out Jesus, then you're not feeding the people really at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Hey, let me give some shout outs here. There's so many people hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. Damon, good morning to you. Mateus, our good friend from California, praying for those fires in California. My heavens, that looks terrible. Pray for all those uh, that are in the path of these fires. They're they're pretty bad. James 16897, good morning to you, Jen Nugent. Good morning to you, Paul, our friend from Buffalo. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. PC Pedro, good morning, T-Storm. Uh, Yvonne and Gus. Gus, good morning to you, Gus. Glad to see you chatting over there on the on the Telegram side. Uh, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Thanks for hanging out. Jane Steves, good morning to you, Jane. Thanks for being on the team today. Mike Kay, our good friend uh, from, from Virginia. Praise Jesus. Eileen, good morning to you. Anna, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out today. Sharon is here. Praise God. Sharon, always great to see you. Thanks for doing it. I cannot actually see Rumble. For whatever reason, Rumble is totally blocked for me today. Like want, I'm getting like an error message. Rumble? Yeah, give us a shout out. <laughs> okay. We've got, oh my goodness, we've got like, of all days to miss, Joe, there's things going on in Rumble. <laughs> uh, it's, pff, it's of the devil. Go away, Satan. Bother somebody else. <laughs> we've got uh, uh, Cherokee Woman 20. James 16897 is over there. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike is over there. Uh, Sci-Fi Mike, if you didn't get the email, but you are on the insider email list, just double check that you didn't miss that it was from the Station of the Cross and not from Joe. I'm going to send it again yeah. this Friday to the ACT insider list. So there be on the ACT insider email list and you'll get it again Friday. Yeah, so people people should should be able to get it where, wherever they're signed up. Uh, God's Child 12, good morning. Peace be with you as well. And uh, Jen, Jen 221A1 says hello hello uh then is now a monthly supporter uh hey thank you sends a thank you saying hello and then sends another thank you saying hello so <laughs> well hello and good morning and thank yes, you and thank you Praise very much again. for uh for those uh for those generous uh uh yeah um thank yous for us <laughs> i don't know what they're called i appreciate Rumble, that but, uh, um thank you gen 221a1 I'm, I'm i'm i keep wanting to say 221b because that's from sherlock holmes but <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think that's everyone on Rumble, Joe. Hey, Lori, good morning. <laughs> Linda and Wheeler is here. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Uh, Jane, good morning. Jane pointed out abortion clinics and liquor stores. They were open during the pandemic. They were considered they were considered necessary. So they were allowed to be open. Let that sink in. Uh, Timothy, good morning to you. iCatholic Mobile is on the team. Again, great sponsor of our apostolate. Check them out. iCatholicMobile.com. Don Franco, good morning to you. Praise be to God says blessed blessings to you all that Easter Sunday during COVID with just the Pope celebrating the Holy Mass was surreal. I sense something wasn't right at that point. Yeah, <laughs> that was definitely not right. That's for sure. Patty, good morning. Our friend from the Hill Country. Junior Barr, our friend from West Texas. Good morning to you. Rachel Jordan, Jane again. Uh, Don Paddock, good morning to you. Mimi is here. Good morning. Praise be to God. Also from the Hill Country, by the way. And Daniel Hyatt, our friend from 
Boston is here, is on the team over on Facebook. Uh, I see there's a lot of people hanging out on, on YouTube. Brandon, Joseph, good morning. Helen Grace, Patricia Parsons, Miriam. Jay is on the team, all caps, all the time. Jay, good morning to you, Jay. <laughs> Jimmy Z, Flying Tigers, you're the best, brother. God bless you. He says, we need more pastors like Bishop Strickland. Yay and amen. I would agree with that. Judith, good morning to you. Christine is here. Liz Fench is here. A chesty Marine, uh, uh, our friend is here. Praise be to God. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. Janice, and we have the recipes is here. Anthony Mad- Madia is here. Good morning to you, Anthony. Uh, Improximus, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Jimmy Z is here. Jimmy had a, said he's got a, there was a miracle at his parish, a Eucharistic miracle, but apparently, uh, that didn't go over well with the parish pastor. So, uh, that's, that's kind of sad. Hopefully we're going to, Pray that that gets reported. <clears throat> that that happened properly. here in Buffalo a few years back. We had a, did it really uh, it under? It was not under our current bishop. It was under our, our previous bishop, I believe. Oh um, man, he kind of just shut it down and didn't want it. They don't like miracles, it. eh? Yeah, something like that. Oh man, that's just terrible. A few, a few years back, Nani Yvonne, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Thanks for for commenting and hanging out with us today. Really appreciate that. Haiti Johnson, good morning to you. Uh, Frank Rangel is here. Little Daisy's back. Little Daisy, glad to see you again. Thanks for hanging out with us today. It says, love Bishop Strickland. Praise God for shepherds like him. Yay and amen. KSB, good morning to you, KSB. Glad to see you guys on the team today. I had another thought, Bishop Strickland, and that was um, just that, the, do you, okay, this is going to, I don't know how this is going to sound to you. I don't mean it to sound in any particular way, but. Do you sometimes think of yourself in terms of St. Athanas- Athanasius of Alexandria in the sense that do you feel like you're in exile? Do you do you see any parallels, correlation between his exiles in and out of his diocese and, and maybe your own? Like do you feel like this is a time of exile for you? How do you characterize your own situation, your own retirement at this point? Well, really, Joe, I, I do think about St. Athanasius um, – you know, contra mundum, as is said, against the world. Um, and thankfully, uh, I'm not really like Athanasius was. I mean, in the fourth century, really, truly against the world. But I do feel um, exiled in the sense of very much in the minority. Um, but as I'm sure with uh, St. Athanasius, uh I feel very much at peace with that because it, it it's almost like we're in a time when you know whether you are following Christ or not because the world's not and you know with so many different issues we we have to be contra mundum um and sadly the church isn't as contra mundum as she should be she is going with the world mm-hmm. rather than preaching to the world. But so, yes, I do relate to St. Athanasius and others. Really, I'd have to say more with uh, St. John Fisher, who was um, martyred in, in England during Henry, Henry VIII, and Thomas More. I probably, maybe because they're historically closer, but also I think the circumstances are closer Um that because definitely uh, St. John Fisher was, I mean, he was beheaded. I wasn't beheaded, but I was removed in, in for, for similar reasons, for not going along with the, the party line, in a sense, not really yeah. acquiescing to this new way of, of talking about a new gospel and we're changing things and what was immoral you know, a few years ago is not immoral anymore. Um, I think that in that sense, I'm not willing to sign uh, the the new order that says, oh, well, we're, we're changing things and the truth is changing. Um, Amen. I, I, so I relate to a lot of the saints, actually. And not, not in a, a persecuted way, but just in the reality of, Sometimes it's lonely to stand with Christ. I mean, all the apostles will tell you that, um, except, well, Judas didn't stand with him, and he got lonely in a different yeah. way. But uh, to be with the be with Christ, and he tells us that. He says, you will be persecuted. So it's a, 
it's sort of a good sign that you're, as people have told me through the years, you know, taking all that flack, you must be over the target. And <laughs> similarly, I mean, when you get just a taste of persecution and rejection by the world, then it kind of reaffirms that, well, Lord, I think I'm being faithful to you because the world doesn't like it. And sadly, many in the church seem to be more in the world than, um, I mean, of the world than just in the world. So, yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> if, if uh, hypothetically speaking, if the next pope, uh, you know, uh, I'm not praying for the death of Francis, but, uh, you know, God. Anyway, if, if, if in the next pontificate, that pope should, should call you back to active uh, to give you another diocese. Would you would you accept that? Would you would you be would you be open to that? Sure. Um, I, you know, who knows what the future holds, but um, yes, I would. You know, I I tried to be obedient, um, and I know some say, "Oh, you're not obedient," but we have to ultimately be obedient to God and to Christ and to the teachings that are the the perennial teachings of the Church. But the Pope had the authority to do what he did, and I was obedient to that. And if a new Pope were to change that or, or have a different direction, I would, you know, do my best to be obedient to that. Um, well, it, it's kind of strange to be able to be sort of in a position of, well, being obedient to Christ isn't just as solidly being obedient to the Pope, as you would hope. But the first has to be to Christ, and that's what I operate on. Um, but, you know, if a future Pope, if a future Pope exiled me further, I would um, feel obliged to be obedient, again, balancing it with, is this also being obedient to Christ? And, and I think in the mystery of things, Joe, as you said, I've been traveling. I've been speaking a lot. I think that many hoped I would just disappear once I was no longer Bishop of Tyler. And really, the opposite has happened. Um, and I believe that is, is God's plan. And, and trying to live God's will is ultimately what all of us have to do. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Brandon Joseph, what are you doing in the chat box today, brother? Like, what is going on with you? I can't even. I, I'm only half seeing it, so I'm not even sure uh, what what you're saying. Are you trying to deny the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Is that what's going on there? Uh, I would pray for your soul if that's the case. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm only half seeing it, so I'm not 100 percent sure. But you're asking us to read John 6:35 real loud. You arrogant, prideful bunch. Okay, <laughs> uh, fair enough. I've got John 6:35 available to be read. Let's do that. Uh, it says, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am that cometh to me shall not hunger. And he that believeth in me shall never thirst. I love that verse. I love the entire chapter. In fact, this whole chapter was so pivotal. In my giving my heart to the Catholic faith because I didn't, I had strong problems with uh, the Pope, Mary and the saints, but it was the Eucharist that was the hinge pin for me. So I, like all geniuses, I didn't believe my English translation, so I simply looked up the original Greek of John chapter 6. I just simply found a translator online, looked up every single word in the entire chapter. And guess what? My English, my English translation was pretty darn good. Like, who knew? Like, I just should have just read the English. But nonetheless, uh, I needed to know whether or not Jesus was being literal. So I, I'm not 100% sure what the argument is going on in the, in the chat box, but... I, I love John, uh, John Ch chapter six, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Hey, along the narrow way, good morning to you. He says, I am Catholic because of John six. Yay and amen. I like that. Uh, Mac Thompson is here. Praise be to God. Uh, I love the fact that you guys are hanging out. Edwin Laverty, John 653. You're throwing out John 653 says, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man 
and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. And he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I mean, it just like it hammers the point, right? He pull, uh, Jesus pulls out the, uh, the old sledgehammer and just hammers the issue and then turns to Peter. All right, buddy, they're leaving. Where are you going to go? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. For who else shall we go to? For who else has, who else is, uh, has the word of life, right? Like, so uh, John chapter six is just the best ever. Someone, uh, by someone, the way, someone's laying down the gauntlet in the, uh, in the telegram group, Joe, someone's, uh, Tim H., who I know from my parish, oh boy. says, uh, based on yesterday's topic, who would win in a debate between Joe McLean and Bishop Strickland? <laughs> I wouldn't debate <laughs> Bishop Strickland for starters, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, if he's going to be obedient and be in exile, then I'll be obedient and not, bishop, not debate a bishop. How about that? How about that? Uh, we, don't, so he wins. we don't need to debate. We're on the same side. Amen. We're well on said. the side of Jesus. Uh, I do want to ask you a little bit more about the uh, upcoming pilgrimage, if that's okay. Have, have you you have you ever been to Greece before, Bishop? No, no. Um, I've been thank I've been blessed to be in a lot of places, but I haven't been to Greece. That's one reason they talked me into this pilgrimage. Was uh, I've always wanted to do that? Those the footsteps of Saint Paul and and just that area of you know that's so connected to the church, but so foreign to me in many ways <clears throat> you know if you ha- if you could only choose one place to visit like you could only get one one place anywhere on planet earth from a pilgrimage perspective where would that be well um in the context of of the, i would say ephesus i mean that's really where i i am looking forward to visiting specifically and i I, I want to learn more about it. I know enough to know I, what I don't know, I guess, and what I do. I want to learn. Um, I mean, there are many places uh, that are attractive to me to, to visit, but Ephesus would be one place that uh, I think I can learn a lot and get in touch with the, those earliest developments of the church in in Ephesus and around that area. I've been saying that if I could only choose one, in fact, uh, when Ellen reached out to me to ask whether or not I'd be interested in going on this pilgrimage, and I'm like, of course I want to go on a pilgrimage with Bishop Strickland, yes. Um, she kind of gave me two choices. She said, the Holy Land uh, or or Greece. And I'm like, I've got to go to the whole, i got to go to Greece and not the Holy Land. She's like, why? I said, because if I could only choose one place, I've got to sit in the house where St. John said daily mass for the Blessed Virgin Mary. Like, I just have to, like, for whatever reason, I feel incredibly drawn to that house to sit there, to just be present there and realize that, I mean, how did that actually work? Did like they get up in the morning, you know, and, and uh, you know, St. John, they're praying and then. The Blessed Virgin Mary's like, uh, what time is daily mass today? I think we'll do it at sunrise. <laughs> you know, it's like just like the thought of the the ordinary daily routine of these two of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of the Queen of Heaven and Earth, and the the one apostle who stood at the foot of the cross. It's just I don't for whatever reason, it's it, I have to go there. And I, I I pass up the Holy Land to do it. And then of course to go to Patmos. And to be there where St. John received the vision of the apocalypse, it's, I don't know, I think I'm going to be overwhelmed by all of that, to be honest. But Ephesus is for sure, like if we just did the one place, that's got to be the place uh, for me. Of course, being being where St. Paul was, it's just going to be uh, mind-blowing. I've been to Rome and many parts of Europe, but I've never been to Greece, never been to Turkey, certainly never been to the Holy Land, so... I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Again, we're going to put link to it in the show notes, the station com. but it's an 11 day, it's 11 day deal. And can I just put this on my screen real quick? It says uh, 11 days, May 17th through the 27th, 2025. There's an extension to Rome for, from the 27th to the 30th of May. And uh, I've been to Rome a couple of times. It's, it was, I was in Rome last time I was with Bishop Strickland, as a matter of fact. And you can find all of the itinerary of what we're going to be doing. There's a cruise. The Aegean Sea cruise is part of it. 
the costs, what's included, what's not, all of it is going to be there. Um, but, uh, and again, we'll link to it in the show notes. Select International Tours is uh, who's managing the process for us today. So you should check it out. It's really, really going to be great. Pilgrimages aren't necessarily inexpensive, but I would say they are uh, amazing, maybe once in a lifetime opportunities for many. And um, to go to be, especially like in places where St. Paul preached and was stoned, you know, it's just like, man, like where the rubber meets the road, that's St. Paul. I absolutely, absolutely looking forward to hearing you, you preach in those locations. It's just going to be a, a real bucket list for me. So I cannot wait. Thanks for having me along for the ride on that one, Bishop. Um, there, Brandon Joseph is still going at it in the chat box. <laughs> That's all right. El- have Elric's fun, on. Have fun with that. Elric's, Elric's getting Augustine after it. And everything. It's oh, yeah. Go to town. <laughs> Praise be to God. Um, KSW Benedictine Oblate says, if Trump wins, I may go. If he doesn't win, well, I know I won't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, there's that. There is definitely that. God, God be with us. What is your thoughts uh, when it comes to like the political atmosphere that we're, we find ourselves? I mean, did you ever expect that in this election cycle, uh, in vitro fertilization would be a major talking point in the debates? And yet, like the vast majority of Republican cons- so-called conservatives are embracing in vitro fertilization. Like that is like what that's crazy to me. It feels like it's even more obvious now that the choices we are presented aren't good ones. What do you say about that, Bishop? Um, well, I would reiterate what what you just said. And to me, the whole, you know, in vitro question, I would say that most people really have no idea what what you're talking about, I mean, are very vague about what is in vitro. I mean, what, what does it actually involve? And I think hopefully most Christians, every Christian should, but Catholic or not should say no to that kind of scientific manipulation of life. I mean, it is in in some ways, I mean, abortion is terrible and, and we all know that, but this is sort of pre-evil to abortion. I mean, it's it's just saying, we're God, move over God, we're gonna do it, and we're gonna we're gonna create life. I mean, it's it's it really is like a Frankenstein process if you think about what actually happens. And I think like with I mean, I think the same is true with abortion. Most people don't really think about what really happens. They just say, oh, yeah. the woman has a right to do whatever. A, a child is being murdered, dismembered, and removed from their their home, their mother's womb. But in vitro fertilization, I think, in in some ways, is morally, um, it's it's the precursor to the evil of abortion in many ways. And and it, it is interesting that it just sort of threw from left field. Uh, I'm sure that. Trump thinks, oh, well, I'll push this issue and I'll give everybody will love me. <laughs> he probably had no idea what it really is and what he's really talking about. And um, I mean, he says, oh, we love babies. We need more babies. Well, I hate to tell him the, the percentage of babies that die through this are much more than the ones that are able to survive. And, and yeah. I think the bottom line is God is the author of life. And in vitro fertilization says, no, he's not. We'll take care of this. We'll manipulate it the way we want. The manipulation of life is is diabolical. You know, I, I get the sentiment where couples that are struggling to conceive and have children, they're really they're really open to life and they want to have babies. And so so I get that I get that sentiment. I get that emotion that they're struggling with. But I think the problem is we too often use emotions to justify our choices. You know, Tulsi Gabbard yeah. came on to ABC News right after the debate and she brought up this IVF issue and she was like, well, my husband and I, we were, we were struggling. So it was really helpful to us. And it, that may be that may be a sincere thought. And th- I get that. But at the same time, we can't allow emotions to to dictate 
you know, these, these issues because reason has to control those emotions and it doesn't. And, and it just boggles the mind how many of these so-called conservatives are embracing things that are absolutely contrary to natural law, uh, IVF, abortion, a uh, marriage between a man and a woman. Where is the fight to defend marriage? Where is the fight to win back marriage between a man and a woman? It feels like the Republicans, as well as the vast majority of bishops in America, have just let the issue go. Oh, well, a Obergefell, nothing we can do. We're just moving on now. Hey, by the way, there's yeah. a second collection this week for, for this, that, or the other thing. It's like, yeah. wait, stop. These are the foundations of society, all societies, not some societies, all of them. So, like, I have to think that's diabolical confusion upon mankind. Do you think we're oh, at I, that stage? I agree. Yeah. And really, as you're talking, Joe, what occurs to me is the question, certainly we have compassion for a couple that is childless and wants children, but the the question needs to be for all of us in every aspect of life, what is God's will? Yeah. Is it God's will that we have children? And that seems to be not in the conversation with these right. couples. Maybe it's not God's will that you have children. But it was a, oh, well, you know, how do you know or whatever. But that's what we need to be seeking. And when we decide our will is going to override anything, like you said, just common sense, or natural law. I mean, there's so many things that are part of our society that, you know, has nothing to do with natural law. It's just, it, it goes back to, I mean, I think the danger of science, and I love science, and the church is, is woven into science historically, but it, with science, if you can do it, ultimately, you're, you're probably going to. And mm-hmm. there's so many things that we can do but we never seem to ask, should we do this according to the will of Almighty God? Because ultimately, it all comes from and returns to Him. And if we're living contrary to His will, then we're in trouble. And I, I think that things like IVF are just examples of the question even isn't even asked. Is it God's will that you have children or God's will that you don't have children? We're not asking those questions. It's just like, oh, well, we want children and we we want to love children, which is great. It's better than just saying, well, we're going to have cats and dogs and, and treat our pets like children. But to to not ask the question, what is God's will here yeah. is is a vacuum that even the church is living in where it's a dangerous place to be to just ignore whether it's God's will. Yeah, we've made commodities out of kids. Just think about how many uh, of these ch- children that have been adopted into same-sex couples, for instance, because they, you know, they feel like they're entitled. They're demand. They're demanding this, and and we've acquiesced that ground as well in public society. I think it's you know it's one of those inherent flaws in our system of government. You know, democracy in a representative government is this this whole notion of separation between church and state. You know, we were never intended to secede the ground to a secular estate. That was never the intention, but that's what we've done. Uh, I think it was – who was it? Was it John Adams that said uh, something about uh, – a, a, a righteous people is needed for this, you know, to, to sort of hold that ground. I'm paraphrasing him off the top of my head, and I can't remember exactly the, the phraseology. But but this idea that we are we are supposed to just, you know, be whatever is available and whatever is an option is is OK and acceptable is just absolutely mind blowing. It goes back to something you were saying earlier about uh, we live in a sort of like a godless society today, like it, who was it? Tucker Carlson, maybe it was a few months back, kind of made this point, and he's like, "At no time in history, in the history of the world, did you have an irreligious society, but now we do. Like all societies, pagan ones, sure, yeah. pagan ones, but even they could see the see that there see that there's a spirit, a world, uh, it, you know, in the cosmos. Even they could see that there was something greater than themselves at stake and at play." Uh, they could see it imperfectly, and they saw it wrongly uh, because of the, the the demonic nature of pagan uh, p- 
pagan religions. But nonetheless, they could at least see something. But today, it's been totally tossed out. And now all things are available. All things are on the table. And that truly, I would agree, is the the era of Russia spreading across the world. And I believe we're here. I believe we're there. Do you see... I don't want to get too hyperbolic when it comes to the end times. I definitely don't want to do that. But do you, but how do we not think we're towards the end, though? Like, Bishop, do you think that's reasonable? Well, um, I think, I guess the way I look at it, Joe, I think we are definitely toward the end of the civilization that we've known. Uh-huh. Um, whether it's actually the end of the world. I mean, it's. I think of the flood. Um, yeah. And there have even been prophecies that say something worse than the flood is going to to really get our attention. <laughs> but um, <laughs> whether I mean, you know, whatever of that is true, I think we're in a time where, you know, we've heard of the great reset that the the globalists want, you know, to just. But I think there's a spiritual reset that is I mean, I, you can feel it in the air almost because. I mean, like you were just saying, uh, if you believe in God and you know that we're talking and breathing because God wills that we have life in him at this moment, to for the globe to basically say, we don't even believe, we don't believe in God and we're not even going to acknowledge the question. Um, I think that can only survive for so long. Because you're living in a make-believe world. You're living in a false scenario. And the truth is what prevails. The false messages always collapse eventually. And, you know, I think that's where we are. Uh, What that looks like, I don't have any prophetic knowledge. but And that's why I've said, I guess, my through prayer, my reaction to all of this has been, be prepared. As I said in my most recent letter, for Catholics, be prepared. Examine your conscience. Go to confession. uh, Get your spiritual house in order. And yes, get your physical house in order to a a reasonable degree. Don't just presume that everything's just going to keep humming along the way it is. I don't believe that's the case. And even if the, the physical world does continue to come along or at least sort of, you know, drip along with, you know, a lot of calamities and all, even if there's no dramatic event in the world, we all need to be ready for the dramatic event at the end of our lives yeah. and ask ourselves, am I with God or not? I mean, that that's the question. And that's mm. the question the church should be asking. But even the church has lost her way in too many elements. I mean, the church is still the church. She's Christ's bride, and we have to cling to her with all our might. But um, many in the church are way off the, the track, and, you know, we've, we've just got to remain faithful. But with your question, I think we are seeing uh, apocalyptic realities that have happened before. I mean, like the the, the flood of Noah um, or other calamitous moments. And I think that, you know, I, I think it is global as well. I mean, as yeah. people are pushing this global society, this global church that really isn't a church at all, all these global things remind us that, I mean, you know, the Roman Empire collapsed. And that was the end of the world for a lot of those people, at least in, in anything that life was totally different, but it is global in the sense that it's not, it's not just the United States, uh, but it's in the, the world is, is facing this, where we go, what prophecies are actually accurate to what the future is. I don't know, but taking all that into account, it's, it, it really says to me, we need to be on the alert, not yeah. fearful, but on the alert and ready to to stand with the Lord, to stand with the truth that God has revealed to us, no matter who, even within his church, are telling us differently, we need to stand with the Lord. Yeah. 
there's so much it feels it feels like there's a, a pressure rising around the world to your point i mean uh, in, in south america there's huge huge rallies down there because people are getting sick and tired of their government's overreach and uh socialism marxism in in south america of course in south africa you know their farmers are being murdered and slaughtered and uh, and there's chaos down there and other parts of africa with warlords uh, fighting amongst each other and the innocents being caught in between uh, there's plagues and pestilences throughout Africa. Of course, China, you still have persecution of the Uyghurs. You still have a persecution of the Catholics and Christians in China. And that's only getting worse. That's not getting any better. And the Vatican deal doesn't seem to to like shed any real light on on all of that. That seems to be more and more complicated and and uh, and more scandalous to the faithful along the way. And, and brinks of war, Iran and uh and uh, the the Hamas and Hezbollah and Israel and and then of course Ukraine and Russia and you add all of this together with economic decline collapse and global movements of migration that is unhinged. I mean, it's not responsible to love one neighbor isn't to like allow for all manner of chaos. It should be ordered. Should be ordered rightly. This is what reason and intellect is supposed to do. Control these disordered passions. Care for your neighbor. Well, what is the care for the neighbor when Venezuelan gangs are taking over apartment complexes in Colorado or hotels in, in El Paso and women and children are being put into sex slave trade in the, in the result? When's the last time we heard a homily from one of our bishops along the border condemning coyotes outright and saying never, ever support them or, or, or like where was the last homily from a bishop in Mexico? you know condemning the drug cartels and the corruptions in the government it doesn't happen it just doesn't happen so we're seeing this pressure build i don't think you have to be a prophet i don't think you have to believe in garabandal i don't believe you have to come to any like some sort of prophetic conclusions i just think you read the headlines and you can go hey listen some shoe is about to drop just be ready well, but i think be ready i think that's the point is go to confession Live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, be obedient to your state in life. And then I guess it doesn't, at that point, you're at peace. And it doesn't necessarily matter from my perspective. If I were to do those things, live in a state of grace and pursue virtue, I mean, what happens at the Vatican, you know, it's bad. But at the same time, I don't have to let it steal my peace. Uh, and certainly, um, I won't be judged based on the sins of Pope Francis or any of the Vatican cardinals or dicasteries or any of those things, uh, for, Father Marco Rupnik, I'm not going to have to be held accountable for him, but I will be held accountable for everything that I've done and said. And golly gee whiz, I got to tell you, it keeps me up at night sometimes uh, about some <laughs> of the things I've done and said. So I, I just find it, I just find it very, very interesting. And I feel like, and I'd like to get your comment on this too. I feel like, like it's part of the strat, the diabolical strategy to to uh to corrupt souls is to push us through all this pressure politics economy social societal pressure and something going we went back to uh, a little while ago and I talked about your speech in buffalo and about that personal relationship recognizing him and um how can we jesus says that uh you know he is the way the truth and life john chapter 14 and he is the shepherd of the flock, and his flock hear his voice, and they recognize it. How can we recognize his voice if we don't know him, Bishop? You know what I mean? Like, how do we, like, I feel like the noise is drowning that out. And because we really don't have a great relationship with him truly, his voice is becoming fader and quieter, and we, we can't hear it through the noise. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like we better double and triple down on that personal relationship now before it's too late, because I feel like it's going to be too late. Do you think that's fair? Oh, I'm just, Joe, you're, you're we're singing from the same sheet music. Uh, I believe that, and that's that's been my advice to people as I travel around. They said, Bishop, what do we do? I've said, get to know Jesus Christ and what he says and does in Scripture much more deeply in your life. I mean, one example, Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We're hearing the opposite of that from the Vatican and from many voices in the church. Many high ranking prelates are saying, oh, you don't need to deny yourself. And the cross is, is you know, overemphasized. 
And you don't need to worry about sin. God's all merciful and God's going to forgive us. And we're all going to just merrily go to heaven. So don't worry about anything. Just follow Jesus. Well, if we're hearing that from prelates of the church that we should be able to trust, but it contradicts what Jesus said and did, I'm going to go with Jesus. And and the interesting thing, Joe, one good, I mean, you know, I'm just a country boy from East Texas, but you got to use your common sense. What in one litmus test and all this is what's the what's the harder path? Is it easier easier to say, oh, Jesus doesn't worry about your sins and, and this can be moral if we decide it is, just follow Jesus, or to listen to him, deny yourself? That's as contrary to our culture as you can get. Deny yeah. yourself? No, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. I mean, that couple, and I don't want to pick on them but because it is a difficult situation, but are the couples using science to say, we're going to have children no matter what? Is that denying yourself? Right. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me? The, the world says, oh, don't do those first two steps. That's, that's too hard. That's, a, that's a, a, a perfectionism that's being expected. Well, it's what Jesus said. I'm going to listen to him. Yes, it's tough, but he always tells us as well. I mean, you look at the gospel as a whole. You look at what, who Jesus is, how he presents himself. He says those tough things. Take up your cross. But he also says, it's okay. All things are possible with God. But the key point is with God. Not pretending we're God, but do it with God. And yeah. I think that that is not what we're hearing from the world, from the church, from really anyone at this time. But that's what we've got to do is say, I'm, you know, I've quoted just recently, as for me and my house, this is from um, the, the book of Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I mean, with God is is the key. And anything that's taking us away from God, we need to look to his son. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? I mean, just recently in one of the daily gospels, we hear Jesus being uh, attacked because, you know, he has dinner with sinners. And a lot of that is in our time is used. Oh, well, we just have to welcome the sinner. Absolutely. But Jesus welcomes them that they may be changed, that their hearts might be converted. And what we're hearing from many in the church, some of the highest prelates of the church have said, oh, well, Jesus welcomes sinners, period. And they're not calling them to conversion. They're not saying you're living a sinful life. They're just saying, oh, well, Jesus welcomes sinners. So we have to welcome sinners in their sin and not call them to conversion. That is the opposite of what Jesus said. And it leaves them in a state of condemnation. Like you said, Joe, we're two Joes, and both of us are going to answer for our own lives, not someone else's. And not we can't use the card that says, well, the Vatican said what we're doing is okay. Right. right. What did Jesus say? Yeah. yeah. It is a, tr a tricky piece of business. I mean, certainly— Certainly, you know, we we are raised, trained, catechized, um, you know, to trust in the church. And we should, praise be to God. But you have to be discerning. and You can't just throw reason out the door uh, in the process, right? So you, you, you don't need, you don't need a, an encyclical from the Vatican to tell you to, uh, to use good and right uh, judgment when, uh, when discerning some of these things that come either from the Vatican or from the world itself. But somehow we're in this all or nothing category. And uh, I guess I got to be all because it's the Pope. I better be all like not uh, uh, you're throwing reason out the door. That's never the intent. That's never the intent. Yeah. And it, we just we live in this hyper papalistic society. Stay with the church. Absolutely stay with the church. But remember who the church is and what the, yeah. the actual heart of the church is, the mystical body of Christ. Yeah, it's amen. not this human organization that 
organizes people so they can, you know, get more food and clothing. It's <laughs> it's about being the mystical body of Christ. All of the rest, all of the social work comes out of being a member of Christ's mystical body. But if you're yeah. not part of his body, then, yeah, you can do things in the world, but it's disconnected from the Lord. So... Yeah, all, anyway. all of our all of our works of charity should be ordered towards the salvation of souls. It's both and absolutely. it's not e- it's not either or. Yeah. You know, but we're in an, we're in an either or condition and we shouldn't be. It's a both and. Um we love the immigrant, but we don't we don't love uh it we do, we do not tolerate an an unordered unjust system that only creates more problems. And not less, right? So that's kind of the, the world we live in. You're either 100% over here or 100% over there. Nope, I'm in the middle ground. Thank you very much. I'm holding that middle ground. Let me ask you this. Do you see, in the last few years, I think I've seen more bishops, I mean, at least from my outsider's perspective, I have no real inside perspective on this, but from what I can see here and there, it seems like more bishops are like, oh, I better speak up. I better say something. But you see, Suplicans, I think, is a good example of this. More bishops are like, yeah, I can't go along with this. Sorry, I can't. I just, I better say something now. Do you see more bishops coming out and feeling like they, their conscience is bothering them and they better speak up for the truth, even if it might get them in a wee bit of trouble? Do, is that happening or am I just reading too much into that? Well, I think it is happening, certainly not to the degree that I think it should happen, but I yeah. think it, it is happening more. And frankly, not, not as much in this country as should happen, but certainly in other places. Uh, but, uh, I mean, bishops are, are successors of the apostles. Wherever they are, it's the same playbook. It's the same gospel that we should be operating from, um, and that's not even the case. But we, and we and I tell people all the time we need to pray for the bishops to to be stronger and and to speak up more. They're, we're supposed to be shepherds. Um, some have the philosophy of oh, just keep quiet and bide your time. But I guess my response to that is, what about again the salvation of souls? What about the souls that are being lost as we bide our time? And I, to me, that that's not the way to operate. Is to I mean, Jesus didn't bide his time. He right. spoke the truth, and you know, multiple times throughout his ministry, they were ready to get rid of him, throw him off the cliff, stone him, yeah. get yeah. get this guy out of here. But and there was his hour came when he was to go through his passion. But Christ always you know, spoke the truth. And I I think his apostles in modern times need to do that more. I I do see some coming to that, but I think it needs to be a much stronger voice that says, we're going to follow Christ. We're not going to just in committee decide, well, we'll handle it this way. Let's just look to Christ. So, one of the kind of criticisms that I've levied against the the current system in the church that we find today is that it doesn't feel, and I would love to, for you to give me your opinion on this, but it doesn't feel like like the bishop is supposed to be the father of the diocese and the priest his son, but it, instead it feels more like the bishop is the CEO and the priest is branch manager. It feels incredibly clinical, incredibly corporate and sanitized, and it doesn't have this pastoral feel. In an age where we're told this is the – you're supposed to be very pastoral. It's very pastoral these days. You know, it's like, okay, great, but I don't feel pastoral. This doesn't feel – this feels like corporate America to me. Did you – like – and I've been told through some priests, friends of mine, that the process from seminary – at seminary, day one, was they were analyzed – and they were put on a trajectory. You're smart. You have potential bishop. Uh, you could be potentially a bishop someday. We're going to send you on this track. We're going to send you to Rome, get an advanced degree. Or, nope, you probably are just going to be some country bumpkin pastor. So we're going to send you on this track over here, and and we'll let you hear confessions. Don't you worry. It'll be a fine. Uh, you know, like, they're they're put day one, they're, this whole idea of this 
career track, this corporate America track is like built into this whole system. And so we're just churning out. They could be conservative. They might even be more orthodox, but we're still churning out this corporate America style clergy. Okay. That's my outsider's perspective. What is it really like? I mean, you were priest for a long time before you were ever a bishop. What was it like for you? Well, uh, I would agree, Joe, that, um, you know, there was, in my experience in the seminary, there was uh, the language of be a man of prayer and all of that. But I think it, that was sort of winked at, in a sense. It was like, yeah, we've got to say pray, but this is how things really operate. Um, and you know, I have to say, in my experience of of being the Bishop of Tyler and then being removed as Bishop of Tyler, as I've told people, it w- it felt much more like working for, I mean, I never worked for IBM, but it mel- felt much more like working for a corporation, the way it was handled. I mean, even now, it's like, um, the what's the PR picture here? What's the political situation? All of those metrics are used. It's not, uh, well, you were our shepherd and you're not our shepherd any longer. It, it's not from the shepherd or father, pastor uh, model at all. And, I, and it felt very corporate to me. I mean, I, I've told people, you know, it, it didn't literally happen, but it felt like, you know, you see these movies where so-and-so is fired and they, they're carrying their you know, lamp and a pencil sharpener and a cardboard <laughs> yeah. box being escorted yeah. out by the uh, the security guards. It felt like that. I mean, that didn't literally happen, but it, it was much more in that world. It was like, oh, well, you know, don't talk to anyone and no one should talk to you and just disappear. I mean, that was wow. definitely the, the message that came to me was, Bishop Strickland, you've been removed, disappear. And, and I was told, leave this area. Um, I didn't choose to do that. And I'm sure that uh, they're not that happy that I stayed in the area of Tyler. I mean, I haven't been banging on doors or anything or, or creating a ruckus. I've been gone a lot, but my home base is here in Tyler. But the definite feel was this guy needs to disappear and shut up. And uh, I didn't do either. But it, it was much more like, you know, the the ex CEO. What happened to him? The, he's just off the books, not he, he's off the radar, and goes silent. And that's the way uh, the way it works. And it was much more that corporate feel than a church operating through this. And and it definitely pervades everything. I mean, that's one thing that has gotten me. Where I am is I said, I said, I'm going to resist this corporate model and I'm going to do my best to really serve the church and promote the church as the mystical body of Christ and not Mm. as one more political corporate organization that tries to help society. I mean, yeah. So. Yeah, we're we're actually going to be uh, we're going to have to say goodbye here in just a moment because we're running out of time. Uh, but uh, and this has been a fantastic conversation. But let me just give you ask you one last thing, and that is okay. If there's let's just pretend uh, they're not, but let's just pretend there's bishops listening to this conversation right now. What would you say to to bishops right now about the times we live in, about where they like? We're not encouraging disobedience. That's not it. I know you don't do that, but like, how do we encourage our bishops? to be more courageous, to get back to father uh, and shepherd and pastoral and not to clinic corporate America? How do we, how do we get them out of that mold? Well, really, I will share what, what did it for me. I would say bishops, make it happen that you are spending significant time, at least an hour every day in Eucharistic adoration spending time with the Lord. He's there. Be strengthened in him. I mean, to me, priests and bishops, every, all the ordained, really everyone, but especially priests and bishops need to make 
our Lord in the Eucharist, celebrating Mass and Eucharistic adoration, those, that's the lifeblood of our priesthood. Everything else is, you know, a result of that or should be. So mm. I would say bishops, and I, I did say that at the, uh, the USCCB when I was still going to those meetings. I said, we need to be men of adoration. And thankfully, they, they moved as, you know, that huge group of 300 bishops. They did move somewhat in that direction. But, you know, we, that's what gives me the strength to continue to, to speak out in ways that many people aren't very comfortable with. But, you know, that's what I would say to the bishops. Make yeah. Eucharistic adoration part of your schedule. I mean, yeah. and, and I know Daily you holiday. don't have time. Make the time. Yeah, well said. Bishop, couldn't thank you enough for your time today. Really enjoyed this conversation. I think it was inspiring to many people. Maybe not Brandon Joseph, but we're going to pray for you. There's no salvation outside the church. My friend, come into the church. Praise be to God. Bishop, would you give us your your blessing, please? Almighty God, we ask your blessing for all of us, all listening and all of us participating in this conversation. Help us to speak the glorious truth that flows from the sacred heart of your Son. And we ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Bishop. Thanks. You. Thank you again. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow morning for another round. I think Mike Koeniger is going to be on the team. Let's talk about gun control and school shootings. All that and more on the team tomorrow morning on A Catholic Take. Share us with a friend. We'd be grateful. God bless you and God love you.